Welcome back and let's continue with the student public speaking conference. The first speech of the day, of the second part, is a 16-year-old student, studies at Elte Apatzai Cere Janos High School and is also a beloved and very active member of the Endgame Academy and the Endgame Double Club community. He's our sergeant at arms who makes sure that everything is at their place and put together before we start our meeting on Fridays. He spent a great amount of working hours with his speech with mentors Bence, Yolanda and Leandro from Morganstown Postmasters to make his speech memorable and impactful. You can easily recognize him when he's speaking because he has this special ability to make everyone laugh and also to make everyone reflect <coughs> on important and relevant questions of life. Today, Győri Mátyás Péter, or more commonly known as Maty, M-A-T-Y-I, he asked me to say it this way too, is going to share his thoughts on one of his many interests. Let's welcome him on stage with his speech, The Friction of Fiction. Think of a story that changed your life. Got it? Great. And even if you don't, that doesn't necessarily mean that you weren't affected by fiction. But in the everyday life, we think of it as something second class to reality, even though it affects all of us. But in order for you to understand what you're missing out on, I'm gonna have to tell you what fiction is. Fiction is something non-existent, yet wonderful. It doesn't need to be real for it to be important. It's inspiration for real life achievements. More articulate than a thought, but less limited than reality. So thoughts make up fiction, right? But thoughts also make up ideas that are based on reality. Well, yes and no. On one hand, ideas are a collection of thoughts, but on the other, what is the difference? It's that fiction hasn't been proven. Yet. Jules Verne was just your average science fiction writer from the 1800s. In his book, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, Captain Nemo and his men were cruising through the dark depths of the cold sea in a 70 meter long submarine called Nautilus. But we have to go back to the real world. John P. Holland, an up and coming engineer, once woke up, made his breakfast, and then he ate it and then went for his morning jug. But you have to know one thing about John. He hated the sun. It was like cancer to him. So when the morning light hit his skin, it was like a gun was pointed at him. So he ran into the closest shade he could find, and it happened to be a library. While waiting for the sun to set, he was reading through the other usual authors, Shakespeare, Plato, and Homer. But the book that piqued his interest was in the science fiction section by a young author named Jules Verne. He couldn't, be, he, he couldn't put it down. It was fascinating to him. A ship under the sea? No, that's impossible. But the more he thought about it, the more he realized, I can make this. So he did. Because John P. Holland is the first person to make a US commissioned submarine. And in his in honor of his beloved book, he called his company the Nautilus Submarine Boat Company. This is how a great mind was affected by a great piece of fiction. He and Werner changed how we look at naval discovery and warfare forever. And you see it, right? Jules Werner just made up something for a science fiction book and then somebody came along and made it a reality. And this isn't a fluke. It's happened multiple times throughout human history. Think of flying or the moon landing, for example. The latter is so outrageous, people still think it's fake. What about me, though? This is my speech, after all. How was I affected by fiction? It was a rainy afternoon. I was four years old. I loved <coughs> Thomas, the tank engine. He was my hero, my messiah, and my idol in one train. So I sat down on the sofa 
<laughs> watch yet another run of his gospels, his teachings. I turn on the TV and then disaster struck. Thomas had crashed. I was livid. I saw nothing but red. My mind could only think of one thing, carnage. It was like Shiva the destroyer took over me. I grabbed the figure you see next to me and I launched it at the television. It was perfect. Right on the money. Pedaling through the air like a falcon ready to get its spring. And then it hit it. It broke the TV in half. No remains of it whatsoever. Maybe sometimes fiction should stay fiction. <laughs> maybe because it's horrible, like in George Orwell's 1984, or maybe because we should misinterpret it. The great Vignette Descartes said that we are because we think, but I say that fiction shapes culture, and culture shapes our way of thinking. So if we are because we think, then what we think is because of fiction. <clears throat> and I showed you examples when one person was affected by fiction. But it can happen to multiple people too. And we see a person with round glasses, we think of Harry Potter. It's not important, unless you're a person with round glasses, then I am sorry. But you know what is important? A perception of reality. It's actually more important than what reality is. The best example of it is Jaws. How we are absolutely terrified of sharks. We think of them as these naval death machines, even though they kill fewer people than vending machines each year. And you might watch the movie Jaws today and think, well, this is not scary at all. But the next time you go to sea, you will be probably wary of sharks. <coughs> but in the grand scheme of things, this is not important. What about wars? Why were there so many wars in ancient, medieval, and modern times? It's all because of the culture. People grew up in this community that endorsed violence. And when they grew up to be leaders, obviously we can't expect them to not solve their problems by it. Take the Romans. They are one of the most civilized uh, civilizations of all time. Yet we think of them as these conquerors. And it's because one of their most important gods was Mars, the god of war and bloodshed. So we can't expect the Roman Emperor not to solve their problems by war. They just want the blessing of the gods, or the culture rather. I mean, this was thousands of years ago, but this is how fiction can affect humanity. <coughs> but there is one more way, though, how fiction can <coughs> affect us. It can root itself in our personality. John P. Holland and I were but briefly affected by fiction but it can change your whole life trajectory. Remember that question I asked you at the beginning of my speech? Think of a story that changed your life. Some of you immediately lighted up and thought of something, but many of you just sat there confused. What? Why, why would I have a story that changed my life? And to add that, I say, each one of you has one. Everybody has one. Maybe you watched cards a lot as a kid, and now you love cars. Or maybe you were an avid enjoyer of Mulan and you strive to be a more independent and powerful woman. Or you want to respect women more, in my case. And you say, well, I won't become a feminist because I watched Mulan as a, as a kid, but to that I say, I became. <coughs> so how are you affected by fiction? Did it make you furious? Want to throw something at a television? Or did it make you feel empowered and motivated? For me, it was both. And I had to experience both for me to say, listen to what fiction has to say, it might just change your life. And my question to you is, what is a product of the fictional world you would love to hold in your hands as a part of reality? Uh, have you seen the movie Cloud, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs? <laughs> yeah, uh, put up your hands. If you have. <laughs> okay, so in that there is this machine that 
can affect the climate by <coughs> making it making it rain food, uh, like um, um, I don't know meatballs and uh, spaghetti and uh, yada yada. Uh, and it's called flood sandifer. So that is the machine I would uh, bring into real life, flood sandifer. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>